Welcome everybody to our Festival Revisions Decoding Technological Bias. I am Bettina Vurianke and I am curating the cultural program at the Goethe Institute San Francisco, the cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany with a global reach. Good morning in San Francisco, the Bay Area, or wherever you're tuning in in the morning, good afternoon or good evening. We are very excited about having you. I am now excited about um, the third day of our week-long festival um, revisions today, together with our partners, City Lights, Booksellers and Publishers, and Gray Area. Gray Area is San Francisco's premier cultural hub catalyzing creative action for social transformation, applying art and technology to create social and civic impact through education, incubation, and public events. Gray Area's programming seeks to inspire, educate, and facilitate interdisciplinary engagement around important and challenging topics such as technology and society, the environment, and social justice. City Lights Booksellers and Publishers is a well-renowned and legendary landmark independent bookstore and publisher that specializes in world literature, the arts, and progressive politics. Inspired by the words of Marshall McLuhan, we become what we behold, we shape our tools and then our tool shape us. We join forces in bringing together a week of discussions, presentations and workshops that are exploring how technological bias shapes our cultural realities, the role that images play in that context and what positive actions might look like to strengthen our collective inclusion, diversity, and sustainability. Please visit our respective websites for further information and register for all the upcoming events today and in the course of the next week. There will be many workshops also coming up. We are deeply grateful for that collaboration. I especially want to thank my colleagues in crime, Peter Maravellis, the event director at City Lights, as well as Nadav Huchman, Gray Areas Associate, Associate Director. Thank you for all of your efforts that you have invested into making that festival possible. Our discussions have been a true pleasure and a real enrichment for me. And I also want to thank Matt Chaikin for managing the event in the background. And last but not least, thank you, dear audience, for tuning in. You're always welcome to actively participate in the conversations and to shape them in certain directions by sending us your questions or thoughts via the chat or Q&A function. I'm very excited now about our today or the first discussion of today um, and the first presentation by Jonathan Valle with the title Economic Media for the Decolonization of Money. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this event, Gary O'Bannon. Gary O'Bannon joined the University of Missouri, Kansas City's Bloch School of Management in 2012 as an adjunct instructor teaching masters and undergrad human resource management and leadership curriculums. After his retirement as the director of human resources for the city of Kansas City, Missouri in 2019, he began teaching full-time at the Bloch School in January, 2020. Currently, Gary moderates UMKC's Critical Conversations, a community-facing series created to address systemic racism. They are available online. Make sure you don't miss out on the series. Please also consider to watch the Journey to Leadership video podcast series featuring interviews with community leaders from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Gary is the creator and host of that series. He has been a recipient of the Awards of Excellence from the National Public Employer Labor Relations Association, as well as the Local Administrator of the Year Award 
from the Greater Kansas City chapter of American Society of Public Administrators. In 1994, the Kansas City Globe newspaper cited, cited Gary as one of the 100 most influential African Americans. Gary, thank you so very much for being here with us. It's such an enrichment having you here. Without further ado, I am handing now over to you. The screen is all yours. All right, Bettina, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. 1994, when you say that, wow, how quickly time flies by, right? All right, so as Bettina said earlier, depending on your time zone, I wish you either a great afternoon or a great morning from wherever you may be viewing today's event. I am Gary O'Bannon, Associate Professor at UMKC's Block School of Management, and it is truly my pleasure to host this monumental event and engage with one of the, one of the most respected speakers on humanities and media, who I will introduce to you shortly. If you're attending this session, there's probably a good chance that you know or have heard of Jonathan Miller. He is a revered film theorist, culture critic, and mediologist. More specifically, he is a professor of humanities and media studies and the director of the graduate program of media studies at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. He's also a member of the Economic Space Agency think tank, as well as the Social Text Editorial Collective. His work in media studies includes materialistic analysis of cinema, photography, computation, information, and money and finance. His research is concentrated, obviously, in the areas of film and media studies, but also in the areas of critical race and feminist theory and anti-imperialistic and decolonial epistemology and struggle. Now, truly, I would be here for hours if I attempted to list all of the written works of Jonathan Beller, and I won't attempt to do that today, but it is appropriate to mention just a few. I'll draw your attention to the release of his next book, Digitality and Racial Capitalism, Handbook of Marxism. It's scheduled for release this year by Sage Publications. Another one of his works, or in his latest works, is The World Computer, Derivative Conditions of Racial Capitalism. That was a book that was published earlier this year by Duke Press. A recent article, Economic Media, Crypto and the Myth of Total Liquidity, was published in May of last year. And I encourage you to check that out because it's certainly relevant. And his previous books include The Message is Murder, Substrates of Computational Capital. Another is Acquiring Eyes, Philippine Visuality, Nationalistic Struggle, and the World Media System. And one more that I'll mention, the cinematic mode of production, attention economy, and the society of the spectacle. Again, there are many others, but I'll stop there and I'll graciously ask that you please give Jonathan Beller a soulful visual welcome clap. Now, before I turn it over to Professor Beller, quick rundown on how we plan on managing our time with you today. Professor Beller will speak on today's topic for about 30 to 40 minutes, followed by a handful of questions that I might have for him afterward. We'll close with perhaps the most important part of our time together, which is questions from you, the viewers. So when we get to that point, if you could please place your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, we promise that we'll do our best to get to as many as possible before we close our discussion about 90 minutes from now. So Professor, before you get going on your formal presentation, I want to ask you, because I love the titles of your articles and your books, what is the process you go through when determining how you name your books or your articles? Now, is it as simple as just trying to capture the essence of your topic, or is there more of a complicated process to that? <clears throat> well, thank you, Gary, so much uh, for your really generous and kind introduction. Um, much appreciated. Um, I will jump into that question uh, as follows. I, mean, I think of myself as a cultural critic uh, and theorist and also a writer. And um, I guess part of my job, as I understand it, is to intervene in the sort of default dispensation of um, a society which is founded on violence. And in as much as that's uh, true, my titles are an attempt to, to, to answer um, the default function of language with some sort of poetic innovation. Because as I'll be, as I'll be um, elaborating here a little bit today, um, colonization is deep. I mean, it is certainly about land and, and territory. Uh, and um, sovereignty, but it's also about representation and language. And our language is so deeply penetrated by uh, power, let me just read it that way, that to 
innovate in languages actually also to intervene in power formations. And so in certain ways, yeah, I'm just trying to tell it like it is. But in other ways, I'm absolutely trying to innovate words in such a way that they open the imagination, open my imagination for one as the person who's got to write the book, but also hopefully my readers. And um, that's all about dialogue too for me, that this opening creates a space for a potentiality, which I'm very excited to share. And just one more follow-up. Um... Uh, on average, how long does it take for you to complete a book? It really depends. I mean, certain projects took, you know, eight or nine years, partially because of my administrative duties, you know, as the former director of the Media Studies Program at Pratt. More recently, I've taken a little bit of time away from administration, and so I'm working a little more quickly. I have kind of some saved up thinking, <laughs> which I've been <laughs> try, trying to find time to work on, um, and that's part of, part of my struggle, right? How do I... Um, focus enough to do the writing. So the last couple of books, I mean, there's kind of three now, um, have taken a total of about five, six years. And, the, and your latest one is coming out when? Well, the latest one is under review right now from Minnesota Press. Um, what, uh, it's um, probably going to be called for the decolonization of money, but it might be called of communism. I'm actually still thinking about the title. Uh, and that one is, doesn't have a publication date, but probably within the year. Well, hey, look at that. You've already uh, broken some news. So those who are attending and who heard that get a little bit of a sneak peek as to maybe what that book just might be titled. All right. Well, Professor, thank you for that. Without further delay, audience, Professor Jonathan Beller. Thanks so much. Again, Gary, thank you. Um, also, thanks to uh, Bettina, to the Goethe Institute, to uh, City Lights and to Gray Area. It's really a pleasure to be here. And thanks especially to the audience who's taking time um, out of their busy schedules to, to be here now. Um, and as Gary mentioned earlier, uh, after I finish speaking or even during, if you want, um, we can have some conversation um, and comments, questions, and I'll do my best to, to give provocative, if not satisfying answers. Um, I, today I'm going to be talking um, uh, through several ideas. There's a, kind of a lot of condensed ideas and arguments in this talk. Uh, some are highly condensed. So if things um, need to, explication for you, um, again, feel free to ask uh, towards the end or, or question uh, what's being said. I'm gonna be introducing this concept of um, economic media, um, which uh, for me is an emergent media form. Um, it has a history to it, which I'm actually not gonna be telling here, but I want to just comment on um, this aspect of historical formation of, of cultural um, of, of cultural form, which is that these things do not sort of emerge ex nihilo. They don't emerge because of the invention of a single person. They're actually, in my view anyway, smelted in struggle. So when um, you have an emergent media, it's actually answering some of the requisites of power uh, and also responsive to, and maybe responsible to, to a certain extent, the needs of people who are undergoing oppression. Um, and one could do very interesting research and work on history of photography, this way, cinema, uh, radio, television, other media. Uh, I'm not gonna be doing that here today, but I just wanted to mention that this is um, something to think about. I also wanted to give a kind of a trigger warning. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna be talking about uh, cryptocurrency uh, towards the end of this uh, talk. Um, I wanna make sure that it's understood um, for me anyway, that I do not believe uh, that I am anything like a Bitcoin maximalist, um, that I'm not a, an advocate for cryptocurrency. I'm not here to sell cryptocurrency in any way. Um, I don't believe in technocratic solutions to longstanding social problems, uh, none of those things. But because I see mediation as also sociality and social relations and the materialization of social relations, I'm trying to um, discuss a potentiality space, which I perceive um, as emergent. We have a kind of a mutation in political economy um, and mediation. Uh, we're living through that right now. Uh, and that affects the way in which um, semiotics functions, the way in which communication takes place, relations are structured, and social organization um, becomes possible. So this is a, sort of the area that I want to um, enter into today, this, uh, this notion of economic media, and talk a little bit about um, the colonization of, <clears throat> of semiotics in the life world um, by what I'll be developing under the idea of racial capitalism and computational racial capitalism, and then point sort of towards the end of the talk towards some possible sites of intervention and transformation. Um, let me uh, share my screen now and uh, take you to it. I'm gonna talk, talk through some slides here. So hopefully people can see that. Um, that's the, the title of my talk. 
Looks great. Um, great. And um, let's see. All right. So economic media for the decolonization of money. Uh, I want to. There's there's an idea around um, which you've probably heard uh, the financialization of daily life, as Randy Martin said. I'm uh, speaking of the financialization of everyday life. Uh, that um, addresses the colonization of not only the life world, um, but also uh, practice, social to psychological, by economic logic and by capital. It, it implies a kind of optimizing logic, uh, uh, framing almost everything that we do at a certain point, to the point where the qualities of things have been profoundly transformed by the culture of capital and by the realities, the material realities of capital. So implied here is a, a kind of a subject formation, relationship to risk, aspects of uh, feelings of stress, the kinds of uh, imperceptible, but nonetheless real changes, which um, have reorganized our psyches, our subjectivities, and our relationships to one another. Uh, the mediations of those things are one of something I'm going to be talking about today, but some of the effects are the kinds of precarity we see. I'm talking about material, but also um, precarity, but also precarity regarding health. Uh, this kinds of objection uh, people experience in relationship to celebrity and social media. Uh, this sort of psychological suffering and feeling of um, erasure, which is so much a part of a world of representation, which is informed by capitalism and the spectacle. Generalized immiseration, the pandemic, which we are still living through and has the world still in uh, a crisis of really um, unrepresentable and I think unconceptualizable uh, degree, I mean, uh, uh, a kind of pain which is very, very difficult to, to register. Um, just on that, I think it's difficult to really uh, come to terms with the fact that it's not a virus that has uh, rendered um, the world in its current state, that the virus is um, the tip of an iceberg, which has everything to do with economic security, social protections, healthcare, uh, environmental racism, agribusiness, many of the things which um, make this pandemic uh, the crisis that it is. It could have been otherwise. Um, hopefully, uh, there won't be another one. But we, it's also a wake-up call, uh, and people are waking up. For certainly, uh, I, I don't have to to tell you that. Uh, other things which um, are resultant of this financialization of everyday life, <clears throat> as I understand it, things like climate change, ecocide, climate racism, uh, because the financialization of everyday life, which turns everything into a um, risk-reward calculation. Uh, asks us to also function as individual agents and makes long-term thinking very difficult as we calculate for our own survival on a daily basis. There are all sorts of forms of neocolonialism, the kinds of forced migration that we see globally, uh, in which um, we're currently a uh, global migration unseen since um, the end of World War II has been taking place. The rampant racism, uh, certainly experienced in the US, um, but also in Europe and in many respects around the world uh, is, I would say, an aspect of this uh, process of financialization and the colonization of the life world by capitalism, the policing, the militarism, and the fascism, which is an extension and um, an exacerbating factor in uh, and around that racism, and the genocides, uh, which are part and parcel of um, the current functioning of the world. I have uh, Ami Césaire in quotation, uh, in parentheses there, because uh, Césaire uh, bitterly remarked about the Holocaust, that um, the reason Europeans uh, were um, upset about the Holocaust was not because the, uh, of what was being done, but because it was being done to the white man. The, the, norm, the, 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 the normalization of uh, genocide as part of the business of, as usual of capitalism is something that I also wanted to point to and is one of the things that's underpinning um, my talk today. So the, the series um, that um, I'm speaking in is about systemic bias, which I understand as a war on the dispossessed, uh, an ongoing war, which has um, many, many prongs and uh, is waged both consciously and unconsciously uh, by people who are signatories. Uh, to the terms of the social and uh, accept the default functioning of many, many of the technologies which have penetrated the everyday. What it would mean to 
to, to fight against this, I think is an open question, but we have many, many examples of struggle to learn from. Um, but we see systemic bias in suffrage uh, and, and the law. I mean, so much is going on with voting right now in the US and um, the biases in the legal system uh, from the history of the United States and elsewhere are, are quite clear and well-documented. We see it in healthcare, we certainly see it in access to housing and education. We see um, bias in the press, uh, and call it a war on the dispossessed. I'm thinking about some of the coverage of uh, the first uh, war in Iraq when um, the New York Times published a list of the thousand people who died um, in that war. Of course, they were um, all Americans, right? The Iraqis uh, didn't, um, Manifest. They didn't. They didn't enter into the representation by the press because uh, they were considered to be insignificant. Um, they were thought of as noise. And it's this kind of filtration system, which is part of the default normativity of um, our institutions and our machines, is something I really want to point to in, in this talk. There was a, um, a long-standing uh, and very important uh, critique of representation. Uh, in post-structuralism and post-colonial theory and in many feminisms, which found that um, uh, Western representation at the very least uh, was uh, ethnocentric and phallocentric, meaning to say that it inscribed um, in a privileged way, uh, ethnicity and whiteness and also masculinity in its default functioning and its organization of meaning, right? So that the very making of meaning was uh, warped by the, the, um, the presence of a presumably white male subject. Similar an analysis has taken place with the history of photography. I mean, Lorna Roth has some really important work. There are many others on film stock, showing that the, <clears throat> the history of um, the development of film stock privileged uh, white skin and uh, did so for a very long time and only changed, at least in the Kodak version of this, not because it was uh, Kodak became interested in um, representing black and brown people in, with their film stock, but because the market for furniture and the representation of wood demanded the development of a, <clears throat> a different um, a different sensitivity. Uh, the point being that it's uh, market that determined the built-in prejudice of the film stock, not science, not possibility. Uh, th there's also similar analysis about the um, inherent and endemic racism in the history of cinema. Someone like Frank, T, Frank B. Wilderson III has um, analyzed uh, cinema in such a way that, the, um, that, that, that what is represented in mainstream film is a white vision effectively. And I uh, go so far as to argue that um, the black has never appeared uh, in a Hollywood film um, because overcoded um, by by whiteness, by white imaginary, by white meaning, by white semiotics. Um, I'm going through these because I think it's uh, important to see that in the various uh, domains of the social, people have been decoding and analyzing bias uh, for many years now. And this is part of an ongoing political struggle in which the oppressed have decided that, no, we will not be silenced, we will not be erased, we will not be um, overcoded by meanings which are invisible by meanings making system which even though it's invisible continues to operate to our disadvantage uh this has uh, been documented in facial recognition software by joy bull and winnie and ruha benjamin who um have said that uh bull and winnie says explicitly from her own experience that uh she was not recognized by certain software and kind of left it at that but then at mit realized that um in fact, this code was being exported um, all over the world and that the invisibilization of her face effectively and of dark skinned people was going to become a default norm uh, in the social. So why is that, right? What, what is going on um, in, in that project? Is it simply because of the technology or is it because who's making the technology and also the markets and the default functionality of those markets? There's also um, been some important criticism about the algorithm uh, Safia Moja Nobel's uh, important book, Algorithms of Oppression, in which um, she begins with a, a Googling of the search term Black girls, and uh, was shocked to see that um, the first uh, pages were full of porn, right? While if you uh, Google white girls, you saw middle class uh, high school uh, kids looking, looking healthy, um, as it were the 1950s. 
So this is um th th these are exa again examples of, of various domains in which bias has been detected and registered and uh, thematized, and is um uh, in many cases uh, being overturned, um, although incompletely for sure. I'm also suggesting here that um, we can see similar things um, in information, and that information uh, is in fact not a natural phenomenon, but occurs um, as a result of the, uh, the the imposition of exchange value on the life world. So that's a longer discussion. I, I may not be able to make that argument in its entirety, but um, in, um, in situating the idea of information uh, historically, rather than saying that it's an ontological structure. I'm also saying that information itself as a, as a thing, but also as a way of treating the world contains many of the biases that we've seen in these other media forms. In fact, it underpin, in underpinning these other media forms, it absorbs many of these biases and operationalizes them. So these are, um, the, the, these are some of the thinkers who are kind of behind um, what, what I'm uh, discussing here. Uh, I can only take, um, I, 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 I'm very grateful to these people, these writers um, and thinkers. I, I've learned tremendously from them. I'm not saying that I'm representing them or their work adequately, but I've, I've um, borrowed certain things to the best of my ability to inform the discussion that I'm trying to, to launch here. So racial capitalism, settler colonialism, white supremacist, heteropatriarchy, these are, um, these are forms which are resultant of, in my view anyway, of the history of capitalism. I'll go through some of the key points here, maybe not all of them, because this is taking a little bit longer than I um, expected, but I'll just uh, mention, highlight a couple of things. Cedric Robinson's um, really significant book, uh, Black Marxism, uh, argues that racism is civilizational uh, and that, um, that race and racial, racialization is a fundamental part of the history of capitalism. The capitalism doesn't evolve as some kind of abstract system of values with, with profits and, and, and wages, but in fact um, requires race as a category which allows to discount certain populations uh, in order that they be um, ultra exploited. So I was particularly interested in, in the Black Atlantic and the um, the, the, the history of black people uh, planet wide, but he goes through, you know, 13th and 14th century European uh, uh, early capitalist societies as well, Just mentions that the, the Slavs are the original slaves, and that this process of racialization, which was, which um, licensed uh, kind of an ultra violence uh, toward entire, towards entire populations is part and parcel of what capitalism is and how it um, develops. Uh, Stuart Hall and Simone Brown's work, um, among others, on epidermalization is also really important here. Hall says race is the modality in which class is lived. Um, while ep epidermalization uh, implies a kind of writing on the body, uh, uh, which is um, obviously uh, an extremely violent process. Uh, so branding is, is, thought, uh, is, is one of the things that um, Simone Brown talks about. Uh, but all the various um, humiliations and forms of violent inscription, uh, large and small, uh, individual and uh, collective, uh, from physical uh, abuse to press representation to photography are part of this process of epidermalization. It's kind of encoding of um, bodies by a social logic. Uh, this is um, also very important in, in, in um, my understanding of racial capitalism and what I call computation of racial capitalism. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The <clears throat> project of um, colonialism and settler colonialism is also key here. Um, and uh, Patrick Wolf uh, says that colonialism is a structure, not an event. I think it's an important reminder. Colonialism didn't just happen once, it's an ongoing process. And settler colonialism is still. Um, being waged today in the erasure and uh, of indigenous histories and indigenous subjectivity, indigenous cultural forms, indigenous expression, indigenous sovereignty, indigenous rights to the land. Um, this is not just a one-time thing. It's a structure, it's a structure which is continually ratified down to the to the present. I've also <clears throat> I've been reading with um, great interest and learning tremendous amount from Leanne 
that is Sarkis Simpson, uh, who speaks about um, indigenous people having thousands of years of experience outside of capitalism and also hundreds of years inside of capitalism. And um, uh, the, the uh, and, and, and for me anyway, it gives a really important sense of the process, the possibility of collectivity and mutual aid um, if it still persists, it still is here with us. Uh, Silvia Federici's um, notion of woman as a historical category of political economy, that is um, something that political economy uh, invented and inscribed in order to extract free labor. Uh, from um, a whole uh, genre of uh, people. Angela Davis's notion um, of the erasure of historical work and agency of black women and women race and class. Uh, Jasper Poor's um, notion of maiming and the right to maim and impose disability as part of what the capitalist state uh, is um, capable of doing and is doing all the time in order to capacitate some subjects and incapacitate others. Importantly here also is um, a refusal in, in Poir's work of neoliberal solutions, meaning to say that it, um, the solutions in her view, or such that they might be, are not, as, as I understand it, are, are not to sort of enfranchise yet another group um, of, of different kinds of people and give a larger slice of the neoliberal pie if it doesn't understand, if it does if, if that enfranchisement doesn't um, address the systemic violation and dispossession, which is part and parcel of global capitalism. I mean, 2 billion people live on $2 a day, right? That is um, not an accident. That's not a, a, a given condition. That is actually um, a creation of the history of capitalism, that radical dispossession of life and future by um, the deep infrastructure and relations of our society. So we can say that racial capitalism is a violent extractive system of violent extractive systems functioning on the historical production of social differences. <clears throat> it is the for-profit elaboration, codification, institutionalization, and inscription of difference as the basis of value production. This slide uh, it's, it, uh, takes the phrase information, a difference that makes a social difference, uh, which is my uh, revision of um, Gregory Bateson's notion that information is a difference that makes a difference. Um, I insert social there because I think it's important to remember that the social is always operative um, in, um, in thinking. Uh, it's nice to imagine that we could do without it. That we, that, I mean, and the, the notion, Nietzsche's uh, critique of science, which he, call, call, which he accuses of having an aesthetic ideal, uh, I think is relevant here. In the aesthetic ideal, we can imagine a world without us, right? That exists without, um, our uh, accompanying thought. Uh, and yet this is a fantasy, right? I mean, this, this is a fantasy, which um, is uh, Donna Haraway calls the God trick, uh, something that's quite dangerous because it disappears history and privilege. So to summarize and indeed integrate the previous slide, we might say that racial capitalism functions the creation and operationalization of a system of social differences and differentiation for the purposes of value extraction that is exploitation and expropriation. This hierarchical system exacerbates differences and thrives on oppression. This is fundamental to what it is. These differences, formal and informal, legal, scriptural, ideological, cultural, material, representational, photographic, cinematic, phenotypic, scientific, computational, etc., are operationalized as part of a global financial system. Race, gender, caste, nation, religion, sexuality, body type, geography, et cetera, and used to assign or impose value or price. Right? This violent constitution underpins the form of value and whiteness. So what I'm saying is that this global process of social differentiation and the institutions which enforce the meaning of those differences are also the institutions which maintain our economy. And that what we take as the value form in capital um, which is seemingly without qualities, right? I mean, it's just pure quantity, uh, uh, $5, right? It's five or 10 or 20 or 10,000 or 10 billion. These things that seem like they're pure quantities are actually vertically integrated with all the qualities and qualifications that I've been discussing so far. And that's what's disappeared in the value form, 
right? That whole process and by which it has emerged uh, simultaneously, um, that's also disappeared in information. So the violent this violent constitution, which I'm describing, underpins the value form, and also whiteness, right? Which is the the race of no race, presumably the the universal uh, subject. Um, so if you hear me saying that um, whiteness is founded on violence and on a history of violence, that then you're hearing me correctly. Information like value and whiteness is a historical is historical is a historical category inseparable from racial capitalism. Social difference in terms of qualities are codified and imposed by hegemony because composed as a calculus of value. I mean, I'm thinking about Cedric Robinson here, right? right. Racism, civilization um, is is uh, racializing, and this process of racialization is fundamental to the extraction of value and the maintenance of the financial system. So we could ask, what price servitude? How much do people pay for domestic labor? Right? What price murder? What price genocide? What price whiteness? We are living in a world of discounted people who must now reorganize for liberation. For, for me, this um, description of racial capitalism, uh, when married, forgive the metaphor, uh, to uh, computation, gives us computational racial capitalism, or what I also think of sometimes as the derivative condition. Uh, generalized organization and enforcement of difference by means of vertical and horizontal information management, including risk management. That's one of the characteristics. These are politics, the state, advertising, finance. These are all ways of managing risk. Um, and if you think about it, uh, when a um, when a country decides to, as a matter of policy, to call a group of people terrorist, right? That is a political wager, but it's also a financial one. It also allows for certain activities to be conducted, certain weapons to be sold, certain policy goals, certain internal um, uh, agencies to activate their legitimacy. Every, every kind of semiotic uh, gesture at the level of state making, but also advertising and finance is, is, um, is related to process of capitalization. What you have also um, with this is the background monetization of semiotic and cognitive linguistic activity. So not only at the state level, um, which may be a little bit more abstract and difficult to, to see in, in an instant, but certainly at the level of something like internet relations and um, the, the way in which the computation functions more generally, we see that this creation of information or meaning uh, in these systems, think about Facebook, for example, uh, produces value for someone, right? If not for us. And this process of collecting the fruits of semiotic efforts by in, in a leveraged way is also something that I see as um, central to the pyramidal structure of uh, computational racial capitalism. The media infrastructure is effectively uh, fixed capital. And this is what I argued in the message is murder. Uh, we can try to communicate whatever we want. And even if our values are anti-capitalist, even as I speak to you here about the possibilities of uh, some future or present revolutions, there is in the background, a system which is uh, capturing my semiotic output and your cognitive relation to me in order to maximize a, a profit from it, right? Though we, could, we could go into the details of how that's taken up in the, in the Q and A if you want, but effectively, something like Facebook and Google delivers value to shareholders. How does it do that? It does that by collapsing the qualities of our messaging into abstract quantities of that are money. So there are other um, sort of important history here of this um, kind of capturing of the cognitive linguistic and the semiotic. I wrote about attention economy um, in the semiotic, in, in the cinematic mode of production uh, in which the screen becomes uh, a privileged interface with capital where screen labor, which at the time was doubted by everyone and thought to be impossible, but where screen labor actually um, means that we take our subjective time and our attention, uh, bind it to technology in a certain way that can be capitalized and is capitalized. And the film industry um, was not just a subroutine uh, kind of entertainment around um, industrial capital, but was increasingly becoming the dominant such that 
slowly our world became organized by screens and by uh, screen labor, or what I sometimes call informatic labor. Uh, <clears throat> informatic labor is the development of metrics to convert work, attention, <clears throat> geolocation, metabolism into information. Information is absorbed as state changes on computers and A becomes part of fixed capital and B becomes a derivative contract on future social action, algorithms that one can bet on. And this is a, 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 kind of the next level here that um, the conversion of sociality into information creates a surface that's receptive to financialization. People can bet on one form or another and uh, do their risk management accordingly by basically betting on certain kinds of social outcomes, which are translated to information and feedback with information. The information capture provided in the returns. In some, I guess, we have the codification of bodies and peoples and a tranching of uh, social difference, which is part of what techno-capitalist racism looks like. We also have, and this is just a kind of a footnote, a shift in the way in which capital validates itself. Uh, Marx's version was that uh, money becomes commodity, becomes more money, right, money prime, and it was the process of labor uh, and the disimetrical exchange of the wage that produced more value for capitalism. That's how you turn money into more money. <clears throat> um, what I'm suggesting here, and I argue this in the world computer, is that um, the commodity is, um, can be better understood as information, that money um, becomes information, becomes M prime. That's a longer story, but I just wanted to put it out there for people who might be interested. Well, we, um, have as a result of all this is a financialization of expression. Uh, we can see the, this in the failure of the internet to democratize. I mean, the internet horizontalized communication, but without remaking the pyramidal and extractive economic logic. In fact, it's become the major engine for profit. So how can the collective um, effervescence of communicati communicative potential, which <clears throat> should mean something like democracy and trans subjectivity and world transformation turn into greater profits for you know, five or 10 billionaires who have more wealth than half the planet. Um, so the digital revolution, we could say it was a failed revolution. Um, I think of it as an example of Caesarism, uh, which was Gramsci's code word for fascism. Uh, and in fact, um, after the failure of the digital revolution, we could say that we've, be, we've um, entered into a period in which the world is increasingly characterized by fascism uh, once again. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, when 45 was president, six or seven of the major world powers were uh, led by uh, leaders who were effectively fascists. I mean, the definitions, one, one could parse the definition a little bit, but, uh, and I, won't, I don't wanna go too deeply into this right now, but uh, the idea that um, one person um, accumulates the agency of many and then stands in for their agency uh, completely follows the celebrity system um, in which, uh, mass expression is converted into um, a single uh, agency and well, property relations remain the same. Uh, the current crisis, the Anthropocene, um, so-called, is the result of financialized world communication platformed on proprietary information systems that are a result of and secured by the institutionalized and networked inequalities of racial capitalism, which is to say that because of the structure of communications uh, and value, we can't make decisions which are beneficial to the planet. Only these optimizing um, decisions for individual capitals at war with one another are the kinds of decisions that get made. But collectivist decisions um, for the benefit of all become structurally impossible. Even thinking in those kinds of time frames becomes incredibly difficult because of the way our communicational system is financialized. And I think you can see here why I'm moving towards this idea of economic media. Um, politically, we can stand the situation on its head by recognizing that finance is an expressive medium, but what is it expressing right now? Right now there's an expression of the logistics and volatility of racial capitalism, in which all activity is formatted as investable subroutines of that relentless and seemingly global project. So finance has been a dirty word, and it should be. I mean, it's, a, it's like money. Um, these, are, these, are, these are words which express um, an unbelievably extractive set of processes. Uh, what I'm wondering here, and this is my kind of writing experiment, my thought experiment I've been conducting for a while, is can we propose a notion of radical finance working towards, let's just say, the transition to communism? And that's a shorthand. 
What would such a decolonial reversal demand? Nothing less than the redesign of the financial architectures that currently network forms of sociality with extractivist media, Google, Facebook, national monies, the banking systems, property law, carceral systems, racial oppression, the denial of indigenous rights, the war against women and queers, in short, the protocols of racial capitalism. And this word protocols is very important to me um, because what we see is that there are these procedural aspects of the social which are formally and informally encoded and that the monetary system and the communication system depends upon the continuity among those protocols. So money is a medium and money is a set of protocols. Monetary media are not pure quantities but carry messages. <clears throat> I think this is a, a kind of an important part of what I'm getting at here. Uh, I gestured to this notion that money is pure quantity, right? I mean, that it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's almost scalar, five, 10, 100, 1,000 million, but it's also denominated, it carries with it a denomination. So for example, dollars, uh, which I'm suggesting has a message. Uh, what that message is may be quite general, but um, what, what it means is that when you hold US dollars, you're also holding stake in the nation state, the, US, the United States, um, and same for other national currencies. And the, the, uh, the, the shifting values and volatility among these currencies and currency markets means that um, the futures of these nation states and their hegemony, uh, their, their management, their returns, their stability are constantly under, um, under query right, and in doubt. And so that each of these monies, uh, which seems to express itself in pure quantities, also carries with the qualities of its individual nation. Uh, this will be important later when we get into crypto a little bit and, and talk about things like Bitcoin, which uh, is also a very limited messaging system. I mean, the same way that dollars can only, uh, can, within the dollar system, you can communicate one, 10 or 100, right? But you're still saying US dollars. Bitcoin is similar. You can communicate portions of Bitcoins, but um, you also are communicating something about the Bitcoin narrative when you use it or when you don't use it. Uh, ledgers, uh, this is an important aspect of, of um, where I'm going. What we would really think of as money, dollar bill is an interface with a vast system of accounts. Right? I mean, rather than thinking of money as an object, if we think about it as an interface with a system, then we start to see it as, as a medium in an important way. Issuance, another uh, key aspect of money, which we can um, actually rethink. One of the protocols of money, which might be up for redesign and decolonization. Uh, Perry Merling has this idea of the money view, uh, where he shows that banks following the US model are actually issuers of money in a hierarchy of money and credit in which the highest money comes from the central bank. So the central bank has the best money, the national banks have pretty good money down to the credit cards, which have less money and the money that you get from the credit cards and credit cards issue to you when you spend costs you a lot uh, because it's higher risk. And so the interest rates are high. This is um, the money view that Marilyn talks about. But the key thing there is that Often we think that money just comes from one central place. But in fact, there are in the network of, of, of monetary systems, issuers of money. Uh, the news, I suppose, is that you and I cannot be issuers of money, right? I mean, at least that has not been possible. Uh, we've required states uh, until recently. There is, in the history of money, it's more complex, but kind of what works now is states in a charterless system of issuance in which one pays taxes and pays armies uh, with national currencies. Um, the idea of legal tender is part of that. The further down the hierarchy, uh, one is the more expensive is credit and thus the more expensive is money. So those of us with less money pay more for our money. Some of us pay most of our life for money. Integration with uh, colonization of the fabric of life. So this is something else that the monetary medium has done. It's transformed the character of space, the character of time, the qualities of the psyche, our sense of identity, proprioception, where and what our bodies is, our ideas of the future. This is also part of the financialization of life and the operations of the protocols of money. I mean, this is a deep transformation which goes um, kind of beyond the resolution of self-inquiry. Right? You can sort of think into your mind, you can sort of think into language very, very deeply. And I would say that you still wouldn't hit the limits of its transformation by the history of, um, of capitalism, of racial capitalism. That, that these things are operative all the way down, right? And are, the, and are kind of at the bottom of epistemological questions. So time, right? I mean, we think about time as being just a, 
this thing that anybody can experience, but somebody like Moish Pastone has shown um, following the work of Lukash and others that um, capitalism and industrialization changes the character of time. The time um, was a dependent variable early on. It had to do with when the sun came up, when it went down, when people were, uh, did certain things, change with the seasons. It became an independent variable when it became a measure of wage labor and therefore of, uh, of value where you had trains had to run on time. Um, this is the Goethe Institute. Uh, trains had to run on time, um, but also the, uh, the work day, the measure of the wage, hours or days, whatever it was. You had a stand global standardization of time, which uh, slowly has captured planetary time. This is one of the transformations I'm talking about. Similarly, uh, with that time also, of course, you get modern physics. Um, so one can make uh, sort of similar forays into any of the, the terms listed here. But what if we were make the monetary protocols? What if we can reformat the institutions that hold them in place by organizing ourselves differently in accord with the protocols of liberation from oppression? This is where I get into um, cryptocurrency and economic media a little bit. Again, I wanna make it clear that I don't think Bitcoin is the revolution, please. Um, it's, it's not um, by any means. I think what's important about it is that like photography, cinema, television, and digital media, it signals a transformation in media ecology, in political economy and global organization. It announces the emergence of a new media. And in case um, that doesn't make sense uh, immediately, I mean, if you think about the introduction of writing and its capacity of archivization, right? It actually changes um, uh, species capacities maybe not all for the good, but certainly changes them, where you can actually um, remember things, you can go back to the past in a way with a written record, it linearizes thinking by putting it on a line, uh, um, it creates the kind of temporality that we're talking about arguably, it changes human potential profoundly. The cinema, Pasolini uh, said, um, called it the written language of reality, it suddenly suggesting that like, with a film archive, with visual, you could actually record um, visual the way in which writing could record speech. And that would um, create a huge set of transformations and a new set of possibilities. Those of you who are just interested in cultural analysis, um, I'm sure are aware of, of this and um, thinking, uh, thinking in this mode. So I'm suggesting that crypto is a new medium of kind of this caliber, right? That it's actually um, bringing together various, uh, constellating uh, various, historical vectors um, in a new way. And that this is a space full of danger, uh, but also a space of, of potential. Full financialization means that in capitalism, practically all media functions as economic media, that is extractively. Um, so music, right? Maybe we listen on audio cassettes, now we download it, uh, or we listen to it on our, we stream it on our computers. These are, these are becoming extractive algorithms. At the same time, you see that monetary media express values platform on organized systems, as I was saying with the US dollar. This convergence of media forms is the real meaning of convergence when the term is used to describe the absorption of prior media by computation. I mean, we had analog media, uh, which have been slowly digitized. Uh, effectively now, we access almost everything uh, on our computers. By we, I, I'm, I'm speaking about the global north, but, but not only. That's a, that's a longer discussion, but I just wanted to footnote that. The absorption of media by financialized information says that all media have become digital economic media organized by a virtual machine. <clears throat> that kind of total system or, or AI that I've been speaking about, what I sometimes call the world computer. To sustainably change social relations, we must also reprogram this virtual machine. So that's um, to me, uh, one of the salient political questions of our time. How do we do that? We might do this by reprotocolizing economic media, by occupying and decolonizing the convergence of computation and money. Crypto shows that this occupation is possible. But what about decolonization and the end of extractivist mediation? So when I say that crypto shows that this occupation is possible, what we've seen is that you know these um, these uh, new forms of um, money making and uh, monetary mediation not platformed on nation states are beginning to displace national monies in very interesting ways. As I said, the jury is out on what that means. Um, I have other comments I could make about that later, um, but, it, but what it shows is that 
there is a de desire to exceed the capacities and to transcend the capacities of national money. Again, not all that desire is progressive. I mean, there's a libertarian aspect to this, which is most objectionable in my view, but the possibility of transforming the protocols of money, of occupying the space of money and doing something with it by recognizing it as a set of codes and protocols that can then be decoded, cracked and remade to me um, is one of the ways in which we might break the stranglehold of computational racial capitalism. So some of the things that I'm, uh, I'm thinking about and seeing is that uh, is this idea of platform cooperatives and the possibilities of something like platform communism. Again, I'm using communism as a shorthand here. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone knows what it means, um, but I have a sense of where it's going. So crypto is no more the revolution than was photography, cinema, or the internet. Again, um, these opened up sp potentiality spaces, which um, were dialectical, something they opened up realms of freedom and also new forms of foreclosure and capture. I think crypto is similar. Uh, the outcome for crypto is not a matter of contemplation, right? It's, it's actually a matter of recognizing that this is a sea change in social relations and requires um, intervention from the progressive forces in history in order to transform that outcome and take control of that outcome or those outcomes. By reprotocolizing ledgers, issuance, network architecture, we might create money forms that value activities and relations in terms of our own making. That is, we decide what counts as value and what's valuable rather than letting the world market, which is founded on racial, which is functions through and as racial capitalism. We might create money forms, economic media, capable of cultivating qualities that persist in the substrate, in the system of accounts and accountability. We might also be able to value care, ecology, mutual aid, pluriversal practices, anti-racist organizing, queer and other progressive social movements in their own terms, rather than in those imposed by racial capitalism's value form, the form that either externalizes the global majority's real concerns or otherwise discounts them. And when we value things in the global form, we're actually allowing the default institutionalization of oppression uh, decide what value is. It's possible to displace that. I'm not saying overturn it you know, by a single individual or even a small group, but it is possible to suspend and displace that system of valuation in order to create new forms of organization. We might create economic media with issuance capacities that accord with our sense of community. Say for example, where everybody could issue money, where we work with a system of mutual credit with value recognition and temporal aspects, currency that concurs with our historical aspirations. We might imagine a world in which allied groups could write their own futures on an expressive economic substrate, right? That's what a future is. It's, it's, it's a prediction about an outcome, but who writes those? Right now, the financial systems, the financial institutions only. What if we also could write futures and wager on them? Well, I mean, politics is risk, right? Waging a revolution is also a risk. Fighting for social change is risk. We risk, uh, we, we, we risk not doing it, but we also risk doing it. I think it's um, important to recognize that this aspect of risk in the political is a fundamental um, component. We might imagine creating distributed cooperatives, that is systems of network cooperation who create their own currencies and set their own terms of valuation. We might imagine a cooperative of allied cooperatives organized so that, so that internally there is little to no value extraction. That is people participate um, in a mutually recognized uh, um, voluntary mode and such that all participants have equity in the platforms that they contribute to and indeed create. So unlike when you're working on Facebook, you don't just you know, produce value for somebody else, you actually end up having an equity stake in the platform that you make with others. Activists and post-capitalist economies. So <clears throat> that's, I guess, what I'm thinking about. I mean, how, how could we build those things? Uh, the Silicon Valley crypto bros are not gonna do it for us. Um, the close cousins, neoliberalism and fascism are not going to do it for us, right? These are not, um, these are not solutions. Uh, they're, and these are not the people who are gonna solve the questions that we're asking. Um, we could imagine democratizing and collectivizing uh, financial tools and new financial literacies, right? What would it mean to sort of change, transform the financial imaginary and imagine that, you know, we ourselves who are members of various communities and struggle are the ones who are going to reorganize our economic practices, our economic participation. Um, 
in such a way that we could foster solidarity among and with the oppressed, uh, engage in mutual aid, and uh, have the capacity to value forms of care, life making, sustainability, and ecology. Uh, there has to be, a, let's say, a spirit of experimentation. Um, with mutual credit, there are many ways to, to think about this. And there's been a lot of interesting work on it, peer-to-peer -to -peer or friend-to-friend -friend or distributed forms of uh, mutual credit. Uh, in the Philippines right now, without any tech at all, something uh, in response to the Duterte regime and the COVID pandemic um, has emerged called the community pantry, which is really um, each according to their ability, each according to their need, effectively. people bring uh, what they have to offer to the community pantry and take what they what they need in order to make it to the next day. And this is sort of a spontaneous emergence of people's practice, you know, in an economy and in sharing, which no state is organized. Uh, but the state is interestingly and frighteningly cracking down because they feel like it's communist. Organization of cooperation and value creation so this is another, I think, really important area. I mean, how can we um, work together to create value in, in non-extractive ways? In the crypto space, there are these things called DAOs. Some of them are not interesting. Some of them, I think, are a little bit more interesting. Distributed autonomous organizations in which um, people can co-create and uh, share equity in their projects. Um, if this sounds like too, a lot like capitalist finance, it still actually is. Uh, but the interesting thing is it might be possible to within certain spaces create non-extractive, mutually supportive relations and still interface with the market. I mean, this, this, is, this is frankly what I'm seeing as, as a key strategy right now. None of us are going to fully escape the market tomorrow, right? But we may begin to cultivate spaces of conviviality in which um, the value creation and the sharing feels better. It's actually better to be uh, in these spaces to work with the people who uh, are going to respect us, to recognize us. and transform our sensibilities together, right? So, so this sort of idea of a cooperative and a distributive co distributed cooperative seems to me to be a, a key part of the imaginary here. Again, um, the notion of having equity in any, in any platform where the platform is not extractive, but, is a re but because it's built on the activity of participants, it's shared by uh, participants. Uh, what you might have if you have this uh, <clears throat> increasing cooperation among cooperatives is you have an increasingly large space of convivial economy, which is exists in tension with capitalism, but actually opens a spread on capitalism. It gives people a chance to bet between the future of racial capitalism, for example, and the future of these cooperatives or platform communist um, endeavors. What if I want to put more of my money into more of my money, more of my life, more of my being into the place that feels good? Right, the place that actually um, cares about the environment, values other people, is not racist, you know, it's not homophobic. What if, what if these are the spaces that I want to work in, the people I want to work with? How can we sort of make our economies and partition them in such a way that they can be supported, become sustainable, and grow stronger? Uh, that spread is a really interesting space, I think, because it shows that there is an um, alternative financial system that we could actually um, create. Uh, there's more there, but I just wanted to, to mention this idea. Um, and finally, I think this is my last uh, phrase in this talk, which maybe got a little long, sorry, uh, is that we um, might create futures that are written from below, right? I mean, at present, as I said, the financial system is the one that's writing our futures and their, um, our, their, their architectures are simply about outcomes uh, within the space of capitalism. But if we could issue, I skipped one point here, this idea of, um, social derivatives and qualitative derivative, derivatives. If we can write derivatives with qualities, if we can wager on particular practices and particular outcomes that are specific um, and qualified because they um, represent the qualitative dimension of value uh, recognized by a community of practitioners, then we have a different kind of um, economic arrangement. We have a different kind of economic engine. All this is um, quite speculative, I know. And um, somewhat abstract. And yet I feel, um, like I said, as a writer um, and as a cultural theorist, uh, these are important spaces to, to occupy. These, these are really important um, uh, spaces of the imagination and for critique and for practice, uh, which um, if we fail to uh, address, will do what all the other media uh, before it have done ultimately, that has become purely extractive technologies. So this is a, um, I guess, a preamble to 
um, struggle. Well, Professor, you are taking my brain to a whole new level that I didn't even realize existed, and I thank you for that. We need more thought leaders like you, particularly in these challenging times that we face. I want to tip off to the audience that now is the time that if you have questions for Professor Beller, the, please consider entering them now in the Q&A box, or at least in the next few minutes so that we can maximize the time that we have together. In the meantime, I do have a few follow-up questions for the professor. Professor, how did you arrive at the idea of economic media and is this in itself a media theory of money? Um, well, I mean, yes, uh, thanks. I, I, I think, um, my work on cinema uh, early on made me realize that the things, the spaces that we thought of as um, non-monetary actually had a deep um, function and internal organization, uh, which was ordained by capitalist society and capitalist value ext extraction, uh, abstraction. Uh, and so what that meant for me, like I was looking at revolutionary cinema in the Soviet Union, and seeing the way in which uh, Eisenstein in particular, but there are many other filmmakers, including Sigurd Vertov, saw that <clears throat> by showing different things to um, a population, you could re-engineer, in his view, their psyches, actually remake their sensibilities such that they could become part of the revolutionary class. This was an avant-gardist notion of revolution to which I don't entirely subscribe. Uh, but at the same time, it showed the productive aspect of film. Right, it showed that film was actually a machine for the production and transformation of society. Mm -hmm. When I recognized that, when I recognized that that's what some of these revolutionary filmmakers were doing, also with third cinema, um, in um, mostly in Latin America, uh, the other side of it also appeared to me that in fact the, um, cinema was a machine of extraction. It was actually capturing people's attention, uh, and therefore was already I didn't call it this at the time was already an economic medium. Right, it was a. It, it seemed like it was a medium of communication. Behind it, there was an economic architecture, more so with the internet, right? I mean, the internet was, was became clearer, which you had adver advertisers like, you know, searching for eyeballs effectively and selling their clicks based upon how many eyeballs they could deliver. And those eyeballs could be qualified too. What kind of eyeballs, whose eyeballs? So this whole process made me um, more aware that the internet too was an economic medium, a for-profit uh, practice. What was missing in my own thinking was that money was also a communication system. I, I, I've only um, recently sort of turned to this uh, line of thinking, but that money also communicates, because we think it communicates only in quantities, right? What's my bank balance? Um, but because we also know that money and there was a lack thereof um, structures people's experiences so profoundly, their desires, their aspirations, the way they relate to one another, what's possible for them. You also know that media, med money mediates between the social and the cultural and these quantities. So what I've seen coming, uh, coming together, and what I think Bitcoin was really important in this, was that these things were becoming one substrate, effectively, or they were tending towards one substrate. So that something like Bitcoin was a communications medium, like the internet in a way, although very limited, because it could just go more or less, you know, five or three, uh, also expressed qualities. And that we could make the qualities of money more robust, but also control um, the, uh, kinds of qualities which uh, are expressed. This possibility of authoring um, the qualities of money to me um, resonates with what the internet offered, which was that anyone uh, could express themselves, right? Anyone could express themselves. But the problem with the internet, as I said in my talk, is that you couldn't change the financial architecture. Say what you want, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is gonna make a billion dollars. Right, and that and, and that's how it is. We can like do, do, uh, we can we can denounce them all we want, but that's just going to make more money for the shareholders of these media companies. Economic media allows us to also change the protocols of value creation and value distribution that that underpin expression. And to me, that is like you know a really important space of intervention. Now, uh, nearly every foundation here in America, unfortunately, was built on systemic racism. And you mentioned several, housing, education, finance. And by the way, I love your phrase, finance is a dirty word and it should be, it's money. I love that, I actually wrote that down. But uh, explain how money itself is racist. Uh, well, I mean, what I was trying to, to get at, I mean, I should be a little more specific maybe. I mean, 
modern monies, um, I, I think is what I really mean. Um, and money, uh, which is part of the system of racial capitalism that I described. Uh, what I was trying to get across, and it's um, difficult even uh, for me, who's like trying to like express this stuff to, to think this all at once, is that you have this vertical integration of all these racist institutions, uh, which have benefited um, from uh, basically rolling over the debt on reparations, right? Not paying reparations, not not um, addressing historical uh, atrocities and historical violences, but capitalized on it. And um, I'm looking for the right word. Uh, what's the word when you turn over a loan again and again, and it, it gets it becomes more money? Compounds, yeah. compounding the the debt on on justice, right? That is um that system of um, value, which has compounded the debt on injustice, is what informs money. That's what money is actually. Money is like something that we'll spend in a society where all of that is legit. And, and so what I'm what I'm trying to say when I say money is racist, right? Which I guess is probably too reductive of me to put it that way, uh, is that. Um, when you spend in contemporary society, you're validating the structures of racial capitalism. You can't help it. It's kind of like what the one saying about the internet, right? You're speaking on the internet, we're communicating, but we're also making money for these shareholders. If we save our money in US dollars, we're making the US system stronger. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I tell you what, I'm gonna deviate from uh, the uh, process that I said earlier. We were going to engage a uh, professor and, and then I was gonna open it up to questions, but as questions come in, I, wanted, I want to be sure because sometimes when we do these webinars, we always run out of time and we don't have enough uh, uh, time to get all of the audience questions in. So I'm gonna insert a couple of that we have already. Uh, and the first one is uh, from an anonymous attendee and perhaps everybody is going to come across as anonymous, but could you expand on your framing of F uh, NFTs in relation to it being a median. This is a very topical, timely question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, money being made, right? <laughs> that, that, that's a great question. So NFT uh, stands for, at least now it stands for non-fungible token. Uh, and it's um, the most common form is on Ethereum, the uh, ERC721 token, although there are innovations in this. What's interesting about that is it allows you to put um, a non-fungible token, which is indexed to a particular quality on the blockchain, right? Which is the um, technical substrate for a lot of these cryptocurrencies. Without going too deep in that direction, um, that allows you to put qualities on a monetary substrate, right? So if I have a painting and I make an issue an NFT, this non-fungible token indexed to that painting, and all of a sudden this um, qualitative form exists in this um, medium, which is primarily monetary. In the, in the expanded sense that I was saying. That in itself is not that interesting to me because it's um, part of the whole logic of fetishism around the art markets where, you know, the Picasso can be worth more than uh, the life of an entire village or, you know, even a small, small town um, because of the accumulation of capital and the tastes of the wealthy. But what's interesting about the NFT as a form is that it also allows for organization underneath and kind of fractional ownership. So people could issue an NFT and work as a cooperative under the sign of an NFT. An NFT could be assigned to a particular quality, you know, whether it was like a, a beach cleanup or whether it was um, a prison abolition in a particular place. You could you could have um, issue the NFT around a quality and then organize a cooperative underneath that NFT, uh, and where the returns were shared and awarded by whatever by by systems of um, our own devising effectively, where we could recognize one another's contributions to our activist project and share the meaning of that NFT. Now, what's the market gonna do with that? That's a very interesting question, but it's, but it's also been an exciting question because it allows people to actually support um, these activist uh, projects uh, who might not have access to otherwise. So the whole, so you open up a new sort of design space uh, and sociality space with the NFT. That's not happening yet, but I think um, it might. Uh, one more comment here is that some of these things aren't going to happen unless we make them happen. You know, I mean, that, that's the other thing. Um, we need to uh, be very active about this technology. We need to understand it, and we need to to move to make it um, deliver the things that that we need. Now, there's a second part to the uh, question too. Uh, um, is this just reinforcing the same systems that you've been speaking about? Still talking about the NFTs. Well, in the, in the first way that I spoke about it, yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think it's just basically uh, feeding the art market and, and art fetishism. Um, 
And in fact, you know, cynically, it's even, it even intensifies and accelerates uh, some of the things that are happening in the art market where the only meaning of art is money, right? I mean, that's, I mean, when you think about the collapse, a lot of people are investing in art, not because they actually, maybe they like it on their wall and they get some uh, social capital out of the fact that their friends can see it when they have it. Um, but it's purely, purely investment. And in fact, a lot of artists you probably know is um, bought and containered uh, and, and not, not even uh, looked at and then sold uh, later to some other uh, investor. So that aspect of the NFT and of art fetishism, I think is um, absolutely uh, simultaneously typical of um, the capitalist economy and also completely reprehensible because it uh, asks us to imagine that creativity and creative expression exists only for one purpose, which is to serve existing wealth, forms of wealth. All right, another question coming in and I hope they don't mind me uh, mentioning their name. Uh, this is from uh, Ramaya, or Ramla, I'm sorry, Ramla. Um, they appreciate your talk uh, and ask uh, whether or not you could address the ecological cost of mining Bitcoin and what an alternative might look like. Yeah, great question. It's something that's really been um, haunting my own thinking. Um, you know, the, I have two different um, points of view on this. Uh, the first is that Bitcoin's ecological cost is absolutely um, awful. I mean, I think it's like one of the 35th largest country or something in terms of the amount of energy usage uh, it, um, it requires. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's probably less energy than something like uh, other national currencies require to support, especially if you think about their banking system, their ATMs for sure, but also how much their military industrial complexes cost in order to um, support those currencies, right? So if you think about the nation state as a whole, and that's why a media systemic approach to money, I think is very useful. If we, if we see the entire system as being integrated and we could recognize that the energy costs in these other systems is also extremely high. Um, but all that said, that's no excuse for Bitcoin's um, use of energy. I mean, it's intellectually, it's understandable because it was a way of, um, of securing the network, making it too expensive to attack. But there are a lot of innovations there, including um, proof of stake against proof of work, which uh, changed the protocols and could reduce the energy um, usage by a factor of a thousand, I've read. So certainly I would support um, those kinds of processes. And I think that's um, going to be the future. What happens to Bitcoin, you know, who knows? Again, like I said, it's not, even though it's a landmark um, shift in the way in which uh, economic media deploys, it's uh, not the revolution. And I'm, you may have touched on this response, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask the question anyway. Would a global reserve currency like a crypto outside of government control be a net positive for the developing world? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question that I, I find hard to answer because um, certainly the US dollar is not a net positive uh, for um, the developing world. A single currency as a global reserve currency, I mean, that would be Bitcoin, right? That's what people are talking about. Um, that's a game theory kind of thing. For some people, it would be, um, be a good thing, I think. Uh, for others, uh, less good. I mean, states like the United States and China would probably uh, resist that if that became a, a serious uh, possibility. A net good, I mean, I don't know. I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I have a good answer to that. I, but I just want to say that uh, the kind of thing I'm talking about um, in my, today was not about a global reserve currency as much as about the possibility of communities issuing their own currencies, right? And that, this, that, that, that communities could um, create currencies which were valid within uh, their networks, but actually extend their networks and make them inter interoperable with one another. So it'd be possible to make um, currency agreements effectively or value agreements uh, so that local currencies in one um, egalitarian network could also spend in others. The, the math there and the, um, the coding is, is not um, trivial, but, but that, that, that would be the idea that we could have many, many expressive monies, right? Which, um, could, with, which had persistent qualitative values uh, and didn't sort of um, fall back into a single currency with one meaning. Okay, so I'm going to push you back global just one one more time. Okay, so yeah. uh, you 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 sound confident that crypto is not the future of some sort of universal monetary exchange. Is it possible to surmise with some reasonable certainty which form of money may be the most dominant in say the next couple of decades? 
Well, I think I, I do think that computationally platform monies are are here to stay. I mean, I think that. So I, I'm not sort of like saying crypto is done. I'm just seeing um, a spectrum of outcomes uh, possible from the technology. I mean, the same way that we could say that photography, for example, was used for surveillance and for um, the inscription of uh, of racism. Um, and therefore exacerbated certain forms of social inequality. Uh, or we could say that photography and family albums and other kinds of portraiture actually recorded histories that would have otherwise been lost and were really important cultural uh, spaces of cultural preservation and now um, spaces of, of active reclamation and transformation. I mean, there's those two dimensions. I'm seeing that in crypto. I'm seeing sort of like the computationalization of money and the computational platforming of money opens up these new spaces. I mean, if China's um, version or probably the US version or Facebook's version uh, is, uh, prevails, then you'll have a kind of surveillance technology built into money where everything that you spend, everything that you spend it on will be known. Your accounts can be turned off at will by a central authority. Those kinds, that kind of really dystopian, even more dystopian uh, possibility uh, opens up. However, if we have these um, monies which are computationally platformed and cryptographically secured and local and sustained by communities which care about one another and whose social bonds are more important or as important as their, what we think of as their financial bonds, then we'll have a different outcome. And that, that's kind of the potentiality space I'm talking about. So I, I wouldn't want to just like predict, right? I, what, for me, like the cultural questions are really um, matters of activism. It's like, what, what, what future are we going to help make happen? Professor, I'm going to draw your attention to the Q&A because I want to be sure I read the question correctly because maybe the way they have worded it is really meaningful. Uh, where would one place uh, A, the counterfeit within decolonization? I would love for that questioner to, um, to uh, say a little bit more about, about that question if they would. Yeah, well, and that's the way that that struck me too. So I will call that out. Uh, oh, uh, they are going to expand. So I think they will be in the process of uh, typing that. While they're doing that, uh, follow up. Can you give some examples of endeavors to remake monetary media to redesign what people think of as money? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so uh, I've been um, working for a long time um, with a group of people who have been trying to do that. Uh, trying to imagine a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, system or really a friend-to-friend -friend mutual credit system in which anyone can be an issuer, right? And that anyone, anyone can issue credit. And when you give credit to um, some someone, you're also giving them credit in your whole network. So as people uh, reach friend-to-friend uh, -friend agreements, they open their networks to one another. And that becomes a network in which transactions, the transaction space is possible. Um, so that's kind of one idea. Uh, there are others. I'm also thinking about um, this structure of the NFT and the way in which it would be possible to have something like an effectometer in which uh, the network could register its sense of what part of the network needs funding through something, through an interface as, as simple as touch, perhaps, you know, spending time dwelling on particular uh, places in the network that need more uh, fuel or more finance. And you can drip uh, funds um, that way to people or activities that need, need funding. Um, I'm also working with um, a group in the Philippines right now, which is a super interesting, I'm not sure how far this is going to go into the very preliminary stages, but we're talking about the possibility of creating um, effectively a token which uh, gives access to community and a basic income through various contributions and the various activities that people are doing all the time anyway. But creating a solidarity network, which has a treasury, which is um, fed through voluntary contribution, but trickles to everybody, uh, which would allow for an overcoming of um, some of the class inequality, which is still part of struggle in the Philippines. It's not a final solution, no final solutions, uh, but these are experiments in community and, and finance, which I think are very interesting. All right, we're continuing to hope that the uh, participant uh, can expand on their question about where counterfeit kind of fits into this whole, whole discussion. Um, next question, what might it mean to decolonize money, Professor? What does that look like? Yeah, that is the question, right? Um, and that's something that I am I'm really struggling with. Um, to me, uh, the, the process of colonization, which I tried to explain, which is really the capture, uh, the extraction, of the various uh, 
domains of the common, of the social, of the indigenous, of the land. Uh, that's the, the problem, um, which I think I'm trying to address in my phraseology. Um, decolonization, simply put, would mean the beginning of the reversal of that, but that's absolutely not an adequate answer. The reason I'm uh, hesitant to provide that answer is because I really think that comes um, completely out of the struggles for decolonization, which people are engaging in planet-wide, right? Whether it's ind indigenous peoples in the Americas, um, whether it's people who have been colonized by, by Europe um, and Africa and Latin America, Southeast Asia, there are struggles going on which have their own agendas. Um, and those agendas uh, can express themselves right now, but they express themselves as anything from political treaties to philosophy books, to artworks, to shouts in the street. Um, my problem is that the economic media take these things as content provisioning, right? They actually convert these uh, revolutionary gestures and um, articulations and utterances towards liberation and decolonization, they convert them back into capital. So what we need is we need um, decolonizing economic media means that, they, that the values that are expressed by people who are oppressed and in struggle persist in the economy in a sustainable way. They don't get subsumed in the economy. They actually persist and begin to articulate the terms of valuation for the next layer. That's really the challenge. It's very hard to even say that for me, but um, that, that's kind of what I'm searching towards. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you to the participant. They have now had time to expand. Uh, where would one place uh, the counterfeit within colonization, meaning counterfeit monies, images, attributions, et cetera? Is it a method that can work as a median medium against white colonial capital? Having trouble explaining. Well, uh, no, I think you did fine. I think maybe the professor might have a better idea what the question is trying to get at. <clears throat> one more time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can I hear it one, once more? Uh, yes, um, what they were referring to is counterfeit monies, images, attributions, mm. et cetera. Uh, is it a method that can work as a medium against white colonial capitalism or white colonial yeah. capital? Yeah, so, so somebody like Max Haven has, has written about uh, some of the stuff like counterfeiting money or um, marking money in order to use it precisely as an expressive medium. and and transform um, something that's just in circulation among strangers into uh, a testament really of an alternative existence and an alternative sensibility. So these things, these things are very, very powerful. This is kind of what I have in mind. All these monies that I'm talking about aren't technically counterfeit, right? They're not real money. They're not legal tender, these cryptocurrencies. That's been a huge debate among the SEC and the, and the financiers. Is this stuff real or not? How real is it? How legal is it? So in as much as, um, they already express um, dissensus with the current financial system. They're interesting. But to me, the really interesting stuff is the expression that comes, as I said, from subalternity, from the futures which are silenced and from the, the kind of utopias which we harbor but somehow don't find expression. So counterfeit, I mean, are there writing on money, writing with money, money as art, creating fake monies, which are not part of states. To me, that's a very, very significant strategy for thinking about um, what it is that, uh, that, that we might be up to. Um, I haven't exhausted that question. It's a very interesting one. Um, if the contributor wants to say something more, I'm totally happy to hear it. You're muted, Gary, sorry. I cannot believe I did that. Bad, Gary. Uh, uh, yes, and if the caller uh, or the participant wants to expand some more, we, we do certainly invite that. Uh, this is, a, I'll acknowledge this is an unfair question. Um, is it possible that those that have dumped money into the cryptocurrencies could lose every every uh, source that, that they put into that uh, option? I mean, you know, I it's within the realm of possibility. I, I don't know how likely it is. Like, like I said, I think um, crypto is here to stay. I mean, whether the valuation of the entire enterprise should be one trillion or three trillion or ten trillion, I mean, nobody knows. And which which are the um, the best bets? Uh, that's also I think completely unclear. Which is why there's so much volatility. Uh, so my could it all go to zero? I'd say that's super unlikely. Okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> but but not. Yeah, nothing's impossible. 
We could all go to we could all go to zero. Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't asking personally. I I, I don't have a dime of money in crypto, but it, it just kind of struck me, you know, since it's uh uh, pretty un unstable, at, at least as we speak right now. Uh, should monetary transactions be tied to an identity or be pseudonymous? And what are the cost benefits of such a system? That's, um, that's again, one of those things. I mean, I don't think there's one uh, best policy on, on that. I mean, it depends upon like the kinds of, if we're talking about community monies, um, which are uh, also expressive of the values of the communities. And I think there'd be different decisions um, among uh, different people, right? So if a community decided that anonymity was its most important value, then for sure, you know, uh, use uh, a crypto which cannot be traced and uh, whose uh, transactions can be mathematically hidden, even though they can be validated. But some people, you know, uh, would want to connect their financial expression with their artistic expression. In the most direct way, so that would not, so anonymity would not serve. Again, I, I think there's um, not a single answer to any of these questions. I think we have a space of experimentation in play. Like, uh, there's no one best way to make a painting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Professor. Uh, I think we've exhausted our questions. I'll uh, uh, ask you whether or not you have any final words for our audience tonight before we uh, tell them the programs that are on tap up next ahead of us. No, I just want to thank everybody for um, hanging out and um, also to encourage people to begin experimenting with these things. Um, we really need to uh, we really need um, to experiment from the progressive cultural side uh, with finance because if we don't, we know who's going to be doing it. So thank you. Well, Thanks, Gary, also for, for everything. Yeah, you bet. Uh, and let me check one more just to see. All oh, those are just individuals who are thanking you for the presentation. I wanted to be sure that we didn't leave any questions on the table. Professor Beller, Professor of Humanities and Media Studies and the Director of the Graduate Program of Media Studies at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I learned a lot today, and I'm sure I can say that is the same for those attending this event. I wish you continued success in all you do. Please keep up the great work and keep up the needed commentary because we'll certainly continue to follow your works. I'd like to highlight the sessions ahead of us at 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Ryan Milner and Whitney Phillips will present their new book, You Are Here, a field guide for navigating polarized speech, conspiracy theories, and our polluted media landscape. After that, at 3 p.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. Eastern, artist, writer, and teacher Jur Thorpe, the author of Living in Data, will be in a conversation with artist, researcher, and educator Rami Ron Morrison. I hope you can attend both those sessions. To everyone who can hear this message, I'm Gary O'Bannon, thanking you again for your participation, and I wish that you and everyone you love to please stay safe and stay well. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>